this is an unusual uh, procedure because you are supposed to have read at least some of the text. I sent and I sent fishing around for things which could be of interest uh, to this uh, audience. And then I got the questions, and there are many questions, and they are very uh, difficult. Uh, question about nature, question about uh, philosophical question about my sort of offhand use of the word critique, which is a bit um, um, a, a big problem, and also about um, Gaia. And uh, I think, given my present interest, I will mainly turn around this question of. Uh, ecology and what does ecology do to not only philosophy but also anthropology and the definition of what science uh, is about. So, and then after that we can go back to the discussion around the specific question you, um, you, you, you raise and thank you very much for uh, sending them. So there are questions of course about the actor network theory but that's things I've done in the past, I'm not so much interested anymore in it, so if I don't answer them, it just means that we have too much things to, to work about. And the paper I sent on facsimiles that I was fishing around uh, on this question of digital, what does the digital do to humanities and the definition of art, but that's still another topic for, for the discussion. So what I'd just like to do is uh, remind you of a a set of questions which is basically um, around ecology in, in, in maybe unusual sense of the word, which is not ecology as an interest for nature or natural uh, landscape or natural object, but ecology as a redistribution of a notion, of the very notion of nature. So in the end, ecology as the end of the notion of uh, nature. And that's why um, I introduced this word, composition, not because, uh, I mean, not because I wanted to add, uh, to add another word, and also because it's a very common word with a very nice connotation with compost, which is, of course, the nicest one it has, but also because uh, it sort of captures in my mind uh, this sort of shift uh, uh, once out of nature, to quote one of your uh, poets, what, what do we become? And uh, I, so I try to, the word composition, um, frame the ecological question around not the coming back of nature, but the suspension of the notion of nature, especially the suspension of the politics of nature. I mean, you alluded to Robert Boyle, and of course, I'm sure you know the very important book of Shippin and Schaffer, and you are all aware of this, uh, what I call political epistemology, which was, in a way, invented in largely by Boyle and it's in his dispute with, with uh, Hobbes. That is a distribution of power around the question, uh, the distribution between what is politics of humans per se and what is about the matters of fact, so to speak. And this separation itself is a political separation. And that's why when we talk about reuniting curricula, uh, linking uh, technical universities with the humanities, when we talk about digital humanities, we are talking about not bringing together two things which are separate, but actually interrogating a distribution of power, a way of distributing um, agencies, and one of the questions is actually on agencies. So my work since, for many years now, since we have never been modern, has been around this question of how, how, do, we, how do we do, um, what's the successor of this constitution that distributes agency around this division of labor between those who are supposed to represent politics proper and those who represent epistemology, the word representation itself being of course used in the two languages. One, the language of politics, political representation, election, and so on. And the other one, representation of nature in the sense of epistemology. I mean, what is fair, accurate, objective representation of a 
state of the object. So, of course, as long as we believe that this is the way the world itself is organized, it's very difficult to, to change because politics of humans and nature is about what things are. I mean, series of causal relations which have to be discovered, but which, on which there is no uh, much uh, grip for morality, responsibility, politics, and, and so on. And when you put the two together, uh, it doesn't help very much because uh, you still bring nature into contact with, with politics. It's a naturalization of politics. If you want. This has been tried, of course. But if you consider that this very divide as a history, and not only an history, but an anthropology, then it's possible to say, OK, now that we live in a different world, where we are threatened by a very different entity, which is no longer nature, what is the way to describe the, what I call the common world? And composition, really, is a word that says the world is not common from the start. So it's not a common world to be discovered. It's a common world to be produced. And the only way to produce it is through the usual tools that we have at our disposal, which are coming from representation, representation techniques. But some of them come from politics, and others come from science. So the divide, which looks completely uh, impossible to pass between the part of campus that deal with uh, bacteria, chemicals, physics, machine, and the part of campus that deal with Latin and Greek and exegesis and the Bible, exegesis of the Bible, I mean, they have no way to talk to one another because there is a, a divide between the, an ontological divide between the things they deal with. But now if you consider that techniques of representation of agencies, which are connected, then the question is, what are the institution, the instrument, the way of describing this double representation? So if I take an example uh, about, I don't know, uh, a dispute around tuna, the red tuna. I mean, it's impossible to begin to talk about the red tuna by deciding the difference between the red tuna as a matter of fact and the red tuna as an, a, a steak. I mean, a steak, of course, but not a steak. I mean, because the red tuna as a steak, or matters of concern, I, I call them, is a, a legal element. I mean, it's, it's a protected species. The reason why it's protected is because it depends on the statistics of a regeneration of red tuna in the sea, especially the Mediterranean, which itself depends on a very complex set of instruments which are themselves disputed even inside the scientists. And in Bruxelles, you were mentioning Bruxelles, and in one office there is, which I visited, there is an office where the controversy about tuna fish statistics is coming. And it's just one guy in an office who is gathering all the statistics of the tuna. Some of the tuna have a little uh, radio but it, then you have to do complex mathematics to generate from the samples, et cetera, and so forth. And if you go on unfolding the tuna, uh, the red tuna uh, connection, you find uh, our president, Mr. Sarkozy, who, who took a great interest in, in red tuna, not to eat it, but to protect it, and who signed, maybe your president did the same, a uh, big international uh, treaty to protect the red tuna, but then, of course, you have the Japanese who are uh, the sushi uh, maker, the sushi shop, who are themselves very interested in red tuna and who are not agreeing with Mr. Sarkozy about defending. Actually, Mr. Sarkozy doesn't agree with himself because uh, he didn't actually last time defend the tuna fish. So my question are really around these entities, agencies, which I call matters of concern, which do not look like matters of fact. They don't have the same, uh, the same uh, shape. Not that they are only a mixture of matters of fact plus some legal or political element. 
Because if you put the two, it's not exactly a bit of science with a bit of social science and law. The connection is much more uh, entangled than that. And so this is why I code this word, composition. Because now the question is not to say, let us discover the world, the world, in which the tuna fish deploy itself, its existence. And we, once we have this definite matter of fact view of uh, tuna, we would agree. We would agree because there is only one world. See, this is the basic idea of a divide which was invented very largely uh, in the 17th century, but political dissent is for the human together in a very complex set of agency, but when we turn to matters of fact, agreement and the end of dissent is possible. So if only we were able to absorb enough matters of fact, we would become political animal agreeing with one another. And that's the problem now, is that this ideal of agreement through the expansion of matters of fact has broken down. Not because we have become irrational, <laughs> as some people say, not because there are um, silly relativists like me attacking the basic of science and saying science is socially constructed, which is not, but because we are coming backwards, uh, s having a retrospective look on this history of a divide, which is a 17th century invention. I mean, I simplify a little bit. It's a bit more complex history than that. Which is coming to a close because of the very extension of science and technology. So the paradox is that the more science and technology has expanded, the more difficult it is to make it stand inside the definition of science divided from politics that had been invented in the 17th century. So I take the tuna fish, but of course, if I take a much bigger issue like the climate uh, controversy, how could you imagine a world where the facts about the climate change will be accepted by everybody and make everybody change their mind? I mean, it is a change that requires seven billion of people to modify their ways of life. There is absolutely no way that we agree on that. So the very extension, the very fact that we've, we have expanded science and technology and the effect of science and technology to something to the size of the Earth makes completely impossible the old idea that only, if only we shared, let's say, a scientific worldview or matter-of-fact definition of the word, we would agree. And it's extremely interesting to see that the basic, most enormous issue, climate change, is precisely the one for which it's more difficult to obtain assent. It's precisely, I mean, probably a large part of the American election would be, would be done on this uh, issue of the climate change, because you can uh, I don't know if you have seen that, but Mitt Romney was uh, criticizing an ad by Newt Greenwich. Newt Gindrich, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Almost as bad as an Irish name. Uh, <laughs> and the ad had two things. One, Mitt Romney spoke French. And that's very bad if you speak French. <laughs> and the second one is that he had said something that climate change climate global change was, was real. That's almost as bad as speaking French. Associated in Rick, in Rick Perry's mind, in Newt Greenwich's mind, to socialism. So if you speak French, it means you're already socialist. And if you believe in global warming, it means that you are going to impose on the poor American uh, the domination of a state which even the communists didn't manage to have. To make. So uh, we, we fought the Soviets, and now we have to fight the people who, who believe, they say they believe, even though there's no real controversy on the fact of the matters. Uh, we believe 
they believe in uh, global warming. So we have a situation where precisely because of the success of science and technology and their effect, and of course global warming is one of the most major consequences of the very way industry and our way of life has developed, the idea that you could obtain consent by expanding the scientific worldview is, is moot, has become moot. So what, what's the alternative? And that's where composition comes in. Of course, it has a difficult uh, connection with critique. And I, this is a bit of a, of a caricature, I agree, because the opposition between critique and composition, and there are lots of critique, critical spirit in the notion of composition, of course. But I take, I, I, so I took critique as, uh, and there's a philosophical argument here, which we might get into the discussion about what's the object in that, uh, the whole critique in the Kant sense of the word, but that's not the object. So here, the argument is simply to say, if you, if you listen to the word critique, as, as a physicist we hear about it, as a critical point, I mean, that's of course is a, is a great, and it's not an opposition with composition. But there is a, um, a reason for which composition would sort of refer to me as a, as a sort of contrast with, 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 with critique, precisely on ecology. Because a lot of the ecological movement reuse the notion of matters of fact known scientifically to obtain a political traction. So they say, since we know the fact of the matter, then action, political action, will necessarily follow. But the problem is that this is reusing the definition of nature, natural, and matters of fact, which is the one of their enemies. And that's why the climate gate is so interesting. Actually, climate gate is the name of his brouhaha around the, the false discoveries of fake data. Uh, and there's no fake data, but people suddenly discovered that scientists exchange emails. And that was a big surprise to everybody because science is supposed to speak without any voice. I mean, no one is supposed to do the work, it just speaks, nature speaks. So the idea that it was actually scientists speaking, exchanging email, and doing the good work of any scientist, that is, this data is not very clean, this one is cleaner, so can we shift it and we will have some consequence? And I mean, this all cooking, uh, in the good sense of the word, I mean, French sense of cooking, not in a <laughs> was considered by the positivist enemy as a proof that it was a fake. It's very interesting to see the, the, the conflict of the epistemology it's fascinating for a philosopher of science to see an, a whole epistemological paradigm coming to, to its end, so to speak. The, the defense of science through epistemological means, in my view, came to an end with the climate gate because it was impossible to defend this practice of science with the usual uh, argument that bumping on the table and the fact of the matter speak for themselves because that's the argument of the enemy of the climato skeptics, as, as they are called. So to show you where the things be, where composition goes, just a small anecdote, and then we can answer the, the discussion. And I still need to introduce the, the, this character called Gaia. I was at a meeting with um, people from the industry specialized in uh, ecological mitigation in their own uh, companies. And I was with a very good uh, climatologist from the Collège de France. Uh, and I was very surprised because one of the industry person in charge of development durable, uh, sustainable development, asked a question which, which is not in the French tone of respect for science, he says, but monsieur, why would you, why would we believe you more than the climatosceptics? So he asked a climatologist after his presentation that there was no controversy about the climate. I mean, there are also controversy inside, but there is no basic controversy about it. 
So this man was an industry person, and he, he asked a question as if it was a question of belief. And say, why would we believe? And the, the scientist from the College of France was a bit shocked. Because in France, we are not supposed to ask another professor from the College of France in terms of belief. I mean, this is not supposed. But the reaction of the scientist was even more extraordinary for those who know a little bit the French situation. I mean, Claude could tell us about it. Because what he said was, he didn't start again on the blackboard. He says, if you don't believe, if, no, sorry, if you are not confident in the institution of science, this is very serious. So he appeals to the confidence in the institution of science. And I didn't want to embarrass him, because we were on the same side and then after that. But then I asked him, when did you ever ask from the public a respect, a confidence in the institution of science? Who, who has ever linked science to an institution? Of course, a president of a university knows that there is a connection. A dean of research knows that there is a scientist knows that there is a connection. But you can read the, most of the philosophy of science, most of epistemology, without ever having a confidence in institution of science as one of the elements of the certainty of the matters of concern. You never hear about that. Actually, historians of science and science studies and people in science communication are the ones who did the job. And we were criticized. I told him very nicely, actually, this, oh, so, some physicists are accusing us of relativism for doing exactly that, showing that we have to have confidence in the institution of science for certainty to be produced. And we were considered as relativists and really bad guys, which had to be really expelled from the university. And suddenly, now that you are attacked by positivists, you turn to us and ask for help. The institution of science has now to be foregrounded. Now, how do you do that? How do you foreground the institution of science at a time when the notion of an institution to be respected is probably the worst time in history? I mean, think of the Catholic Church, here especially in England, in Ireland. Think of a political institution. Think of a bank as an institution. I mean, none of that are too... It's not a good time for talking about respect of institution. And yet it's just the moment when the institution of science has to be respected again. But if you promise that, you have to reinvent entirely what it is to respect the institution again. Because that means that you don't defend science with the same tools as you did when you could say the discussion is closed because now mat undisputable matters of fact had to be, have to be, have been discovered, which is a great boil sort of trope. So this is where composition comes in, because the, 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 that means that the common word is not prematurely unified by an appeal to nature of matters of fact. And if there is no premature unification of a common word, then it means it has to be composed. It has to be composed I mean, tuna fish per tuna fish, if I can say that. It's not the word of nature where the unification would be made, the discovery of which would reflect into political consent. That's where the two from the two representations, the one from science and the one from politics, have to come together. And that's a large part of what I mean by composition. That's why we are so interested in mapping controversies that's why the whole question of the media is, of course, communication of science is, is, is important. So to finish, all of that, of course, will never um, be visible. I mean, there would be no hope of making this um, a world made of matters of concern visible. Um, without this very interesting uh, change into the definition of what uh, the Earth itself is, which is coded for me around these two words, the one which is the Anthropocene, 
which is an extraordinary term invented by very serious geologists to, to name the, the, not the era, but the period in which we now are, as you know, even though they actually might not vote for it in Brisbane in 2012. There is a small dispute about that. They might decide not to vote for the Anthropocene as a name because this name is too <coughs> amazingly mixed to say that the Anthropos, the human in mass, en masse, are actually the main geological force on the Earth, more force a force greater than the volcanoes and even of the plate tectonics would be such a transformation of the paradigm on which we have lived since the 17th century that they, I, I'm told they might just say this is too political, we don't want to use the word. But the word is everywhere now. Anthropocene was even on the Economist's first page a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And the other one is Gaia. Now, Lovelock, I don't know, I'm sure you're familiar with Lovelock. He, doesn't, he lives on the other side of the, of the sea. Well, yes, I mean, about. And he's a very interesting character because it's precisely like Anthropocene. It's one of his mixed characters which sort of says once out of nature. We are out of nature. We are in something different. And this difference is, of course, has to be studied by many different types of people, of course, like I mean, artists and political philosophers, um, moralists, all sorts of people can be, and of course the scientists, brought in to try to understand what is exactly this uh, definition of nature which is no longer natural. Because the Anthropocene is a bit like a Mabius strip. I mean, the, the Gaia is a bit like a Mabius strip. You are, we are in it obviously, uh, but she or it, depending on your anthropomorphism of Gaia, uh, is also what is in us. I mean, after all, the work, Lovelock's, uh, one of Lovelock's books is The Revenge of Gaia, because it's a si simple-minded metaphor. But uh, we know, <laughs> we all know, that when you use a metaphor, it's quite important. So that's where the old question, which look completely uh, obscure, esoteric, when we started in science study 30 years ago to deal with this question of, I mean, is Boyle doing politics, as, as you remind us at the beginning, by doing air pump experiment? And where people say, no, I mean, this is experiment, this is science, and this politics is something else. He might have his opinions about Ireland and so on, but that's something different. And when we say, no, no, it's not something different, it's the same thing, distributing agency between those who do things one way, matters of fact, and those who do things one way, and God doing something else. And this distribution of agency is what anthropology of science, cosmology, cosmopolitics is about. But this was a small, a small issue when we were doing this in the, in the 70s. I mean, a very small, obscure issue in science studies. Now that this uh, question of Gaia comes in, and this mixture is, I mean, is it a fringe scientific concept? Yes, partly. Now it's slightly less fringe. Is it a new age uh, type? Yes, also, is it a goddess? Yes, too. Is it a way for Catholic theologian and Orthodox theologian to rethink incarnation? Yes, too. I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinary mixture of, of, of things, and that's why I'm so interested in it. But whatever is the definition of Gaia, and even if you take it as, as a sort of a fringe uh, science, it puts a pressure on all these questions which were very obscure and very lit little esoteric argument, which has completely changed um, philosophy, anthropology, law, and politics. I mean, that's at least why I could this change by the little word composition. And also because it has a nice uh, musical uh, sort of connotation. But also it clearly, when you have a word that you have to compose is not the same thing as a word that you have to discover. And not the same thing as a word you have to uncover. And that's where my sort of loose use of the word critique 
is a word to be discovered or a word to be uncovered is not the same thing as a word to be composed. That's why it's said this maybe two uh, extreme expression, critique or compose, not the same thing. But that's another way of saying modernizing or ecologize, that's a choice. I mean, we, we cannot do both at once. We, either we, I mean, ecologizing is not the same thing as modernizing. So this is a bit of a background of the thing I'm, I've sent you. Uh, I don't know if it's um, a good way to start the discussion. hearing you today that um, I wanted to ask the question, is what you're pointing to really um, an extension of an old 19th century problematic of a divide and a cleavage between the increasing socialization of our existence, of our social and economic system, and the tension between that increased socialization and its you know, fragmentary, individualized um, forms of control and direction. And I suppose the question arises as to whether uh, perhaps new networking, communicational systems, and so forth might provide some kind of technical support for some way of resolving that contradiction if there is an echo between what you're talking about now and some extension on an old problem. And also, not just technology, but the rise of new powers, um, particularly China. We actually have uh, two very important visitors this week, Professor Kuhn Latour and the uh, upcoming, or the, the, the about to be Prime Minister of China. So you're in. We are in China. Yeah, you're coming to our I'm just saying. And I'm just you know, <laughs> <laughs> making a connection here in my own mind that, uh, because just this morning on Irish radio, uh, where uh, we would not be known in Ireland for journalism that is you know, very strongly intercultural and attentive to culture. There was a very interesting piece on this morning's program where this philosopher, um, who does intercultural studies and has worked in China, was trying to explain how China is a very, very different worldview and conception of human rights vis-a-vis -vis the Western world. It's the first time we've ever heard this in the media. I've read about this in more specialized kind of areas of political But I was wondering whether, you know, Different powers as well. There is a shift of power away from the West, which is more marked by that individualism. And whether, you know, between the technologies of the networks and then shifting geopolitics, there might be ways that maybe complementary to the Gaia uh, that you're pointing to, uh, Gaia approach perspective uh, that you're pointing to. Thank you. I will answer them in the opposite order. Uh, the, the, of course, in addition to what I said, the fact that we are not the only powerful modernizer on the planet makes a big, big, big difference. The fact that we are being modernized by China and that we are modernized in part by India and so on uh, makes a complete difference to what uh, where our definition of, of, uh, of, of modernizing um, the best uh, author on this question is uh, Peter Sutterdijk because and he always said that we love globalization when we were the globalizing power. Now that we are globalized, we think globalizing is not that, that great. And we, the French talk about cultural exception. Everyone has now exception. We try to have exception before we were the globalizing. So it's a huge, huge uh, shift. But that's also a great chance because the reason why, it, in my view, we are beginning to do an anthropology of the modern is precisely because of what you mentioned we are no longer uh, the big guys uh, around and that's a great chance we finally finally can begin to think differently about what has happened to us because we don't I mean in a good Hegelian uh, sense we, we we are no longer too powerful the second question is really interesting because a large part I mean technically a large part of the ability to build, again, a respect, what I call a respect in the institution and not in the matters of fact themselves, depend on these techniques of representation allowed by the digital in a very large sense. This is why we should collaborate at some point in this mapping controversy uh, 
project, which is one way, if you don't, if you cannot divide the world anymore in matters of fact and politics, how do you map the connection? How do you build instruments to follow matters of concern, to use my word coding for matters of fact? And uh, so in a way, the digital tools, the network key uh, tool is a very powerful, I mean, without exaggerating the hope, but a powerful new tool, including in journalism, of course, to restore some sense of community. Um, and I'm a great fan of Walter Lippmann's uh, argument about the phantom public and a way of making the phantom public sort of appear. He thought it was the newspaper, but now, of course, it's not the newspaper. It's uh, all these new tools that we are trying to uh, develop. Now, on the third point, it's, it, it's, is it the 19th century? I think it's much more the 16th century. And there's a very interesting book by uh, Tulmin, who was a philosopher of science, uh, who died a few years back, who, a book which I have discovered quite recently, called Cosmopolitik, Cosmo, Cosmo, Cosmopoliti, Cosmopolite, Cosmopolitics. Cosmopolis. Cosmopolis, thank you. Which has a very interesting uh, argument about the fact that, yeah, and it was, it was written in, in the 80, something, yeah, around that. Um, and he was already mentioning that the big shift is a turn back to the 16th century before the scientific revolution, which he called a scientific counter-revolution. Very interesting argument about the, 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 the spread of time. And it's, it's clear that it now, if you, if you read the, the 16th century literature, you feel a lot of, of, of uh, sympathy. Um, the red tuna connection with a, a lot <laughs> will be more comfortable in a 16th century atmosphere, if I could say that, than in a 19th century and certainly in a 20th century atmosphere. In other words, the 20th century is further, seem much, much, much further than the 16th century in this argument. I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but Cosmopolis is, is a very interesting uh, work on that. But you write on China, I mean, it, it changed a lot of things. Great relief, we are no longer the big guys. So we can think again. And now we have stopped thinking. We have stopped, we have stopped thinking, but that's their problem, it's not ours. Too bad for them. Okay, have any more questions for Mr. Joe? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to ask, uh, you think that, um, that I'm asking this from the um, eco-positivist wing of the argument, possibly? Okay. Um, <clears throat> that might not be right, I'm not sure. But reading you um, about, specifically on this question of ecology being the end of nature, I mean, I'm sure that there's an element of provocation in, in that, that formulation, but there's much more than that as well. And it seems to me, reading you, that, that um, much of your argument is about the fact that we face ecological crisis. You espouse that, you, it seems to me that you espouse that and that you see that as a, um, a huge part of the picture today. And it seemed to me reading you that, how do you, I mean, how do you dis define ecological crisis if you don't think that there is some kind of entity or some kind of pre-existing equilibrium or some kind of objectively given identity which has been destroyed or uh, <coughs> disrupted by human agency. And that in that, I mean, I want to hang on to the, I, in that sense, I want to hold on to the notion of nature, because we have to have some description of the object which is being destabilized. This is a very important, difficult question, because does the argument relies on a disruption of an equilibrium or not, if I understood. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the argument. That's the direction I'm going. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, of course, you know, is, is very much, the notion of equilibrium is very disputed in the scientific ecology. I mean, for forests, for 
ocean, I mean, every single <laughs> argument about equilibrium has been criticized. I mean, the sort of acme of the idea well, of equilibrium order. is one way of putting it. The other way is, is simply the notion that there is some identifiable, let's say, object. Mm -hmm. You know, it's either of those. Object is not in question, it's just object as a matter of fact. Matters of concern are very objective. They object a lot to our use of them. I mean, objection, objectivity is not, in, it's not a socially constructed argument I'm making. I hope we agree on that. Sure. Okay. So, if I rephrase the argument, the question this way, which is to say, in the notion you cannot, once out of nature, you have to keep something from the argument around nature, which was the moral economy associated with a long set of values which are also packaged into the notion of nature. So I understand the argument, and it's a very important argument because, of course, when lots of these ecologists I'm criticizing by saying you are reusing the notion of nature of your enemy, it's not the matters of factual definition of nature they hold to. It's the moral import of respecting a nature. So it's the morality of nature which is important. But that's very important for Gaia as well. So it means that it, we are not shifting the, 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 the moral dimension of the natural has always been there. I mean, historian of the notion of nature in Britain, I don't know if it exists for Ireland, but for France, for America, Germany, Italy, Arabic country, for the literature I know, I've always insisted that talking about nature and talking about morality is the same thing. So Gaia, that's why I'm interested in Gaia, because it takes up one of the elements of this moral nature, which is not necessarily equilibrium, but which is responsibility. You, the, that's where agency is so important. So it's not, the object is not in question, but the responsibility, the agency is in question. This is why the ethics, the ethic of ecology is so interesting, because it's always a primary, but why, why do we have ethical relation with the red tuna, or with the gnat, or snakes, uh, and so on? But if we take responsibility as meaning you are responsible when you respond to something that called, then the question of agency and morality, objective morality, to use an old word, comes in. And then it, it can, you can re, re study a large part of history of science. It's not that before nature was just natural and separated from value, and now it has value. There was a moral economy of nature before. I mean, think of Humboldt, or, I mean, a lot of examples. And now we are just in reinventing another economy of nature. And in one of the questions, there is a question about degrowth. I mean, the whole movement about decroissance and degrowth, which is a very important uh, issue. That's, that's where all these issues are connected. So, of course, na nature is a multi-layered concept. One of them is objectivity, but that's not in question. The fact that it's not our making, that's not in question. One of the layers is morality. Another layer is equilibrium. Now, even the notion of equilibrium is complicated because in Lovelock argument, Gaia will always fall back onto another equilibrium. Not because it's maintained in a steady state, but because it goes from one state to the other one. And Lovelock, by the way, is ready to get rid of seven billions of humans, because he, he says in Revenge of, the Revenge of Gaia that when Gaia will be tired of humans, it, it, she will just shake them off. She, she, she will do. How do you say that? Frissonning. Shudder. She will just shudder us off because she can stand only 300 million humans and we happen to be 7 billion. So 
So all these questions are, are sort of, <laughs> but it's not the case that ecology, political ecology in the sense I, I'm using it here, is moralizing a nature made of object. You see the, the nuance in which, in, the question is very important because there is no agreement on this question. Should we defend nature because it's equilibrated and we have distorted, disrupted it? Should we defend nature because it's objective? Should we defend nature because it is the maybe strip of which we are one, uh, one uh, surface, so to speak? So it's us, in a way. We are Gaia. And all these questions are back in. That's why, I'm, again, I'm saying it's, a, it's, a, it's precisely this question which have been completely uh, um, put aside with the divide between matters of fact and politics in the 17th century. This is why the constitution of the modern, uh, so we have stopped discussing this, except in the most silly way, by saying why would we suddenly take care of a moral, a moral responsibility for the tuna fish? But if you say, wait, we always were in a moral economy of nature. To be a matter of fact is a moral economy. It was invented by Boyle, your Boyle, to end a situation of civil war, to put an end to the ludist and all these guys who were thinking of nature, was moving, doing all sorts of things and having agencies everywhere. Precisely to end the 16th century. And now we are back in a question where the multiplicity of agency raise again the specter of political dissent. Because we know that most of the dispute which we are going to have soon will be about water, air, fish, corn, climate, all sorts of things like that. Does that approach... Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very important question because it's of course the one on which there is absolutely no agreement, even no, not that much discussion among the ecologists. Because they, 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 either they believe equilibrium is, is, is a sort of fact, of, a matter of fact, which is of course highly disputed among their own discipline, but also because the moral message of the notion of an objective nature is not actually taken up. So they, are, they just say, well, let's not moralizing this question. You cannot not moralizing this question because there is no other way. Agencies implies responsibility. It's the mystery is how we come to have stopped responding to the calls of agency. And we know when this happened. This happened with Kant. There's an amazing passage in a Kant uh, critique when he says that we should actually, uh, when, when there is ocean, make, you know, I'm sure you know this text, when there is a, uh, the theory of water, the ocean and clouds and uh, storms, etc. the more being in us is the one that shut his ear, close his eyes, and get into a sort of um, silent, this is the faculty, faculty of judgment, and stop listening to nature. Then morality appears. I mean, when you read this text now, you begin to understand that the great mystery of morality, and this is actually one of the questions which was raised, is not that how come that we can feel morality about tuna fish, but through what extraordinary circumstances have we stopped? Sometimes in the 18th century, but it's a long history, not to hear <laughs> the calls of those. And who, what does it mean to be responsible if you don't respond? To be responsible is to respond. And to, to respond to what? To call. And the call is the call of his agencies. So I think it's much better to have a discussion about morality straight on instead of saying, well, no, 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 I'm just talking about science, so let's do a value-free discussion. I mean, that's one of the, <laughs> the distinction between the two is precisely what has completely disappeared with these uh, 
this question, and that's always the case. Sorry, I was a bit too long. I was just going to say, Pat, in a minute, I just want to keep it on that discussion because there is probably that still a lot to be said about nature out there. And as we have NGOs and environmentalists and all kinds of still, still battle for that. Brian, can I ask you, because you had a comment, and maybe you want to make other comments, but you did have a question, this, this concept of recomposition. That, um, that is, um, is it, well, it's, it's Mendel, and also Marx, uh, Marx's term, I think, and perhaps it may add something to this particular discussion as well. But it can have some flavor on how we, how we look at um, dealing with nature out there as, as an entity in itself, and maybe, you know, maybe it becomes what you're talking about, you know, it becomes a more difficult process for us all. Brian, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that the question I submitted really uh it was about Marx and Mendel. Well, just the, the idea of alliteration as much as anything else was also suggesting that, you know, in the 19th century already there were people who were dedicated to projects that involved the recomposition of nature, that nature was right. capable of re being recomposed. But you can go back much further. The history of humanity is arguably the history of interference with an attempt to dominate and to remake nature. Uh, I have uh, a big resistance to nature with a capital M, just as I resist science with a capital S, to borrow Horrocks' idea. Um, so it just seems to me that it's a much, it's an old uh, idea and it's part of a continuity of human development that we aspire in different ways, as genetic engineers, for example, do, as Craig Venter does, to make nature. Nature is an object on which we exercise our powers and which we are in struggle. It's not something out there. It hasn't been probably for 150, 200 years in any real way. But that's, a, yes, that's a slightly different argument, I think. The artificiality of the world in which we live is a very old anthropological element from probably a million years, depending on where you put technology as, as beginning to diverge from biological evolution. Even to phrase this artificiality into man acting on nature is a very modernist way of phrasing the evolution. And of course, you are alluding to Engels and dialectic of nature. So if you want to say that the separation between nature and society and the action of human has never been extant. This is, of course, because we have never been modern, so we never lived in this divide. It would be impossible. I mean, it would mean <laughs> there's no entity able to live in the modernist constitution. We always do the opposite of what we say we, we, we do. And, of course, dialectics, the whole 19th century interpretation of Kant is precisely to say, no, no, this table is full of subjectivity, which has framed and, and incarnated itself into the table so that there is as much agency and spirit in this table as in my, uh, yes, in my mind, plus a few dialectic turn of history. But precisely, the dialectic keeps using the two poles of subject object as the the thing that makes the thing turn. And that's where the word composition again tries to enter into a different route, so to speak, and, and not so much interested in object and subject where the idea even, it, it's a very strange idea of artificiality to conceive artificiality as a consequence of an action of a subject on an object. There are lots of other ways of dealing with, with artificiality. And again, the great thinker of that is Peter Sloterdijk, because that, the whole philosophy that he developed uh, of, of envelope and spheres and uh, the whole argument that he makes, spherology is his, the name he gives it, um, shows that there are lots of other ways than, uh, I mean, it's sort of neo-Heideggerian. There's one question on Heidegger there um, in, in, by someone of you. Um, and, and certainly Schroeder is, is, is a completely different view of his 19th century history. 
So you, if the general argument is that artificiality has been our way of living for now one million years, yes. Now, if the question is how do we interpret artificiality, then there is a divide between dialectic, even though it was doing a lot of things, and the sort of line which would be Schlotter Deck and uh, my stuff, so to speak, composition. Because there is no trace of a subject object dichotomy there. It's, it's much more anthropological. It's a, it's a distribution of agency, each of it with its own sort of uh, brief. None of them really look like subject, and none of them look really like uh, object. And of course, the great dynamism of a dialectic of nature was that it will end somewhere. It will end into the final absorption of the object into the subjectivity, or in the case of Marx, into uh, the, the emancipa emancipation. But what is left of emancipation with a Gaia ready to do this? I mean, this is, this is a very different history. Uh, emancipation, yes, yes. We are being emanci I'm emancipating myself from you, Gaia said. And whoop. So there, there are a lot, lot, lot of other characters in the Gaia story than in the dialectics of nature, and none of them look like subject and object. Gaia is not a subject, even though the name is, has been given to her, or it, by William Golding, according to Lovelock. But it's, a, it's an important nuance between the dialectics of nature and, and, and Gaia. Gaia is not an object, nor is it a subject. It's a strange character which does not continue the line of emancipation which was so important in the 19th century. I think we are way, way back. We, 19th century is too. It's not necessary a place to look at. But artificiality, of course, yes, we love it. I mean, look, we are in artificial space. We have been in artificial space. And here there's a long, tra beautiful tradition, a, a great French tradition of philosophy of technology. Mm -hmm. in that, uh, but now Sloterdijk is certainly a great thinker of that. But it's a very important uh, question. Just to push on the notion of artificial space and matters of fact versus politics is almost two polar opposites. Where do you see representation like film as a mediation of nature? Is that a subset of political agency in trying to motivate a political agency? Or is it, can it also be seen as a matter of fact in its constructive nature of, of nature? And where do you see, and you, you talk to me about Avatar as being and there have been a lot of other films that have evolved nature in very interesting ecological ways. Do you see arts in general as a, as a sort of a subset of this connection between the, po the political agency and the matters of fact that the hard scientists do? Uh, um, well, I like Avatar, which is not a good uh, proof of good taste, probably. <laughs> uh, but I, I saw in Avatar a sort of popular culture shift, which means the frontier is no longer expensive. And suddenly you have to retreat. Uh, Lovelock used this strange metaphor of Dinkirk. I mean, it sounds less, uh, it makes m less sense in Ireland than it does in Britain, but so he said we are in a situation of Dinkirk. We withdraw very quickly. From, from the beach, and we have to go fast. And I, I saw some of it in Avatar. I mean, suddenly we have to withdraw. But people say I was naive, and in fact, it's just because he was preparing a sequel to it, and that, of course, they will come back, and this time they will. Ah, we'll see. When they come back to Pandora, what they do with it. Um, so, of course, we didn't talk much about that, but the third representational. Uh, set of mediation is, of course, from art. And there is no case where 
This is why I built this little program in my school of political arts, because there's no case where this sort of question we are addressing here, like the morality of nature, cannot be uh, handled without another a third level of representation, which is the art. The film being, of course, one of them. And it's very interesting to see the telltale of that uh, when, when uh, uh, Lars von Trier film, which I mentioned, I think, in one of the paper, um, what, what Melancholia. Name? Melancholia. <laughs> I mean, of course, a striking uh, view by a great artist of something which is all about the same thinking, what it is to be in a space which is no longer an infinite space. I mean, when I was a kid, we, 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 we saw the, the, the landing on the moon as the beginning of something which would continue. I mean, some of this generation here might remember that. I mean, who believes that now? I mean, who believes that we will sort of shift? Uh, so the idea, this, this, this idea of indefinite replaced by the, re, the coming back of a sublunar is extraordinary as, as an artistic, as an anthropological phenomenon. I mean, we were no, I, I'm born in a place where there was no sublunar world. From my little city of Bonn all the way to the Big Bang, there was continuity. It was the same infinite space. And suddenly we are back again in the 16th century where the sublunar is different from the supralunar. We will not go to the moon. And when, when, when Gaia will do this, we'll not, there will be no rocket ready to take the seven billion of us on the moon. So where will we go? I mean, this morning we were in the plane and you see the, 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 the Concorde there, which is just there when you, on, in, in Charles de Gaulle, as a sort of beautiful symbol that it shows flying there, it's, of course it's stuck. It's on a handle. And that's a beautiful metaphor. You, yes, we will go. <laughs> that's a complete change. And is it an artistic change? Is it a scientific change? Is it a political change? It's a change of way of life. And that's what the art capture, of course, much faster than the intellectual life, which is always very slow to take up this sort of situation. Okay. My uh, science communication classes are unusually quiet. <laughs> yes? I, I, I want to ask something, but it's completely to change the question to um, matters of concern rather than matters of facts that I feel I'm kind of bumping down to earth a bit. Uh, matters of concern. I, I'm concerned about the, the huge gap between these wonderful philosophical questions which have my head spinning and matters of political concern today. For instance, this week on um, one of the television channels, which was actually a program documented about a Catholic priest. About what? A Catholic priest called Our Island Parish, set on the island of Arra, Western Isles of Scotland. They documented a dispute that is going on precisely like your red tuna one, because the EU have declared this the conservation area, and the fishermen are now going to be forbidden, forbidden from fishing. Oh, that's a classic, yeah. Mm -hmm. The population has been declining, and um, now they're going to be driven out. They're going to have to move, and they see it coming. And it happens to them through a particular kind of class project, which is the Edinburgh bureaucrats coming to Barra, getting their feet in the mud in their suits and everything, and telling these local fishermen what they're going to have to do. And the fishermen are saying that, but we've always practiced conservation because we don't catch the female lobsters. We, we leave the females. And so they're arguing back with their, their local practices, their local knowledge against this, this, this land grab from above. The political configuration is deepened if you know that this is one of the very few Catholic islands among a very largely uh, fundamentalist Protestant area of the world. Right? And this is where they put their conservation area. The same has actually happened in Northwest Mayo in Ireland recently. Interesting. You, you know, so, um, <laughs> it's a 
Could, how, how can you how can you help us get some purchase on these without falling back into all things I like for? Without what? Without falling back into issues of local knowledge versus scientific knowledge, which is where I personally tend to go. Um, can you get me out of that that particular uh, di uh, erroneous dichotomy? I know there is no real local knowledge apart from the scientific knowledge. Can you help me? To, to grapple with this matter of concern and the particular configuration it is producing politically where the world is too big to fail but the rich are going to go on living here for as long as they can and the ones who will pay are the poor, the people whose land can be grabbed, the people who can be forced to move, the ones at the, the bottom of the heap. Yes. There will be a distributional issue in how the seven billion leave the earth. We won't all leave at once. So the seven billions of us, no, no. The, 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 <laughs> you know, they will start at the bottom and eliminate them because we live in a class divided society. And I just wondered how your theory gives us purchase on this kind of issue. Lovelock actually mentioned that uh, the point with the Gaia will not know that the, 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 it, she has to eliminate the, the, the American first because they are the ones who are. And not, not, of course, the Indian who are doing almost, I mean, the Indian are changing quite fast. But this is a very interesting uh, controversy, uh, the mapping of a controversy where, if I understood, the, cat the fact that they are Catholic plays a role in the, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It, would have, it would have been impossible, for instance, to create a conservation area on Sky or Lewis, one of the predominantly Protestant uh, islands. It's mm -hmm. inconceivable. But the question was on local knowledge, and uh, the problem that, I mean, I'm not sure if it gives a, a traction on what you say, but uh, the scientific knowledge is a local knowledge. It, it's not a local knowledge, ethno science, so to speak, plus, I mean, on top of a scientific knowledge, because precisely in those issues, the scientific knowledge is a, another local knowledge, except the distribution of a locality is different. I mean, you mentioned Edinburgh. Or, and Bruxelles, for example. But it is, I mean, as I said about the, the office of, I visited of a tuna fish statistician, uh, it's always quite surprising. I mean, it's very small forces, which are, I mean, huge statistical instruments sometimes, but very small force. So whenever there is a question of class and conflict, the, the rule, which, in my view, of mapping this controversy, is not to add asymmetry even more. That is, the local knowledge of a scientist which are deep, on which probably there is a report, making a report on which depend the decision, the rubber stamping of some bureaucrat, as you said, in Edinburgh, uh, should not be exaggerated into small local sets of tools. That's what I mean by matters of concern. It's the same matter of fact, I mean, it's objective, except it's now instrumented, the instruments are foregrounded, and the locality is foregrounded. The small, quite limited resources instrument is visible. So it means that when you now pit the local knowledge and the other local knowledge, the asymmetry is not that great. And that's one way of getting into this controversy. Of course, I, I mean, we should know much more about this controversy, but it's one way to, to sort of not being intimidated by the very difference between ethno knowledge and the scientific knowledge, which would suppose, if I understand, that we now know for a fact that the fish there are threatened. Well, I mean, as, as you saw, there is a catching, a way to catch the, the fish, which is different. Yes, they, they, they claim they, they only catch the males. Okay, well, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting, because, of course, that's typically a compositionist argument. Okay, now, let's settle down. This is a diplomatic argument, which could be staged now, and it could be simulated. This is what we do with our student mapping controversy. Now, how do you simulate the dispute? What would make the bureaucrat from Edinburgh accept that Catholic fishermen keep their traditional way on the condition that there is a verifiable way of, having, of catching only male. And of course now, 
the discussion has shifted. It's not science against ethno-science. It's, there is no question of science there. It's a question of building a common world. Is it possible to have Catholic... Which, which fish is this? Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, lobsters. Lobsters? <laughs> is it easy to recognize a male from a female? Lobster? Is it different? This is really different. Well, no, they catch them in a, in a they catch the lobsters in a, in a cage, and yeah. essentially the males they keep and the females they throw back. So they're alive and they, and they lift them out. Yeah, but how do they recognize them? Oh, sorry, I don't know. Sorry, I don't, I don't know. That. They do know, they do know. Probably the lobsters. Maybe it's the eggs. Ah, the eggs. Okay. So here it would become, here, that's exactly what means composition is. Thank you very much for your question, because it means now that the politics is not to say, okay, we know from the science that, and then we draw a conclusion, which of course are usually impossible to draw whenever there is a question like taking people out of an island, even if the science is right, they'll say, yes, the science is right, but we don't want to move. And there is no, but there is no way nowadays to stop a discussion just by saying we have a matter of fact, the, un, the famous undisputable matter of fact. I say the matters of fact are undisputable, but we keep disputing. But that's what is new. But it becomes now very interesting to imagine the trajectory. And that's exactly what we try to do in this double major you were talking before. Someone who is as double, what is the way, I'm just imagining here, to make the separation between male and female lobsters um, ob observable to the satisfaction of Bruxelles. So it's, it's, it's a completely different ball game now. The question is, okay, yes, yes, there is a legitimate, absolutely legitimate argument about maintaining your way of life. Now, of course, the Catholic Protestant here, I mean, <laughs> probably more difficult, uh, but it would be quite interesting what would be the ritual for lobsters. I mean, you can imagine all sort of things. And you launch two or three artists there, and it becomes really interesting to re redesign the dispute in a way where Catholicity, maleness and femaleness, gender studies in lobsters, and that sort of thing is now taken into account. And you see, that's the composition is that the more you add things, the more you also have a chance to find an interesting compromise. And here compromise means etymologically promise together. Is there a way to promise together that there is a common word which is composable? Composable might not exist in English, but I mean, which, which can be made to be. Which is completely different, so having a common word as a background, known by matters of fact, on which now you add the politics. No, the politics is in the small local knowledge of a scientist helping the bureaucrat to write the legislation and so on and so forth. Thank you, it's a beautiful case. I'd love to visit this island. It must be fascinating to see male lobsters. Frank? Yeah, Bruno, you, you, you raise an interesting question for me as a kind of a very rational physicist. And you, you, Are you a rational physicist? That's tautology. Um, but you, you raised one issue about the, you said one element of the certainty of science is the institution itself. I think I started thinking about this in terms of the structure and processes of science and the validation that comes from that is extremely important. And yet the very essence of science is the question. And we need guide rails to move through science because science is essentially... The, the question, which question? You said the most important, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the... Instead of institution, you said... I, I said the institution of science is extremely important for us and, and the validation that comes from that. Right. But essentially, I was saying progress in science is incremental and we, we need that uh, certainty to move forward. Each oh, time. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And yet an essential element is the questioning of science itself. So you, you have to question. So I'm really interested in, in, in your, your thought on that. You, you, you were, I wasn't sure if you were challenging the, the position whereby the institution itself can be part of the argument or... I mean, is, is that a valid approach, I suppose, is the question I'm asking. I'm not sure I understand, but I will answer it nonetheless. But, but, but <laughs> if I understand the argument, which is the reason why the institution comes in, it's when you want to regain confidence 
which when exactly this double epistemology that we have, that certainty is necessary to move on, and yet questioning is very important. Many of the physicists in, in France who are climato-skeptics are not paid by the lobby of gas or, 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 or coal. They, they use the physicist sort of attitude if everyone agrees it's fishy. It's something, you cannot be that sure. I mean, if there's something wrong in that, you are not being scientist. So there are a lot of et ethical reasons, I mean, from the ethics of science to doubt because of what you say. And is, the problem is that is this, so now we, we I, I didn't finish my story about the, the climate scientists because after I had said the, in, the institution is very important, he began to, to, to list the number of climatologists on his side. I forgot it was 10,000 climatologists so many boats, uh, satellites. I mean, he made a list. And of course, again, I didn't want to challenge him, but I said, I thought this, this is a beautiful re-coming, I mean, a coming back of the argument of authority. Which is a big, big, big problem when you begin to want to gain confidence back into the institution of science. Because of course, the argument, the numbers count. The numbers have weight. And it's very important to be able to know that these, there are 10,000 scientists, climatologists, and one, I mean, not, they are all sort of discipline, they are modelizer and so on. And that the ones who are climatoskeptic are not themselves working into the thing. But of course, if you say, but the whole of science is about one man being right even when 10,000 are wrong. I mean, and Galileo comes in five minutes later. So, that's where, again, uh, this is back to the argument about the techniques and the digital technique, especially. Is there a metric which allows us, us being the poor guys, scientists or not scientists, engaged into the question of composition? The one about this island of a physicist engaged in climatology and modeling. Is there a way to count again the authorities. Because that's the way in which the, the so that's a very important issue where, I mean, there are lots of science, science, science students working on that. And it's very interesting. It's interesting for the digital tools. It's interesting for the scientometry, bibliometry, and so on, and journalism, of course, which is to learn how to weigh these authorities in, in a new way. Of course, a practicing physicist will do that by looking at the argument, uh, asking his colleagues, um, seeing this, this is something odd there. I mean, there is a, there's a built-in, very complex instrument of, of tasting an argument. But, I mean, a good scientist is always the one who has this way to taste. So there is a quantif quantifying element there in a good scientist knowing that this is... But this weight, weighing, is very difficult to transport in the public arena because it's immensely difficult. As, as, as it, and it's very rarely described because the philosophy of science is not supposed to be... I mean, even a physicist, you say you are rational, which means you have a good nose. But it's not the same thing as being rational. Or being rational is having a good nose. And how would you describe it? It's like describing my father's wine tasting abilities. I mean, it's a very difficult instrument. I think you know, there is an exhibition here on the, at, the, at the gallery, science gallery on that, <laughs> which I, I will see on Monday. Uh, and that's where I think the, the, the work, this, this is where the, the common work between people coming from the science, from the political science, from the digital world uh, should collaborate because it's a very tricky uh, issue. What is the weighing of authority when the question is no longer, I'm a scientist, thus I have authority, doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Scientists are not believed, yeah. like in this little anecdote, or they are, they are interrogated as people of belief, yeah. which is quite extraordinary. I mean, Rick Perry, who is a, a governor of Texas, accused the climatologist of doing all the climatology for money. The guy is entirely paid by the lobby of, 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 of oil. 
So how do you resist that? S some of my friends in climatology in France, are, they are depressed. They are deeply depressed because they cannot use anymore the argument, we are doing the science. These guys are just agitators. The problem is that these guys are saying we are the scientists and you are the lobbyist because you do that for money, for grant money. So suddenly you realize that the epistemological argument don't have any weight anymore. What are the tools which make it possible for them, again, to have weight? And that's where you cannot stop any argument by saying, I'm a rational person and you are the irrational person. I mean, even though we do that in business, of course, I mean, as an administrator, we do that. But we know it. It doesn't work for me at all. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, we have to build a common world. But we cannot build it with the argument of rationality anymore. That, however, change is so deep and so, so interesting. But the heritage of progress in science heritage of progress has to validate the, the institution itself because it, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean? you mean? What I'm saying is that you, you know, the, the argument you made there about the lobbyist calling himself a scientist and the actual scientist. Yes. It's not a balanced argument because the, the scientist you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, this, this idea, it, it's, it's a constant incremental progress. And there's a legacy, there's a history there, there's a heritage of validation. Yes, but the problem is that the climate skeptics say they are the one inheriting from a giant like Galileo. Mm. And they are doing real science while the others are just modelizing. So, and, and if, a, if a climatologist begin mentioning the number, <coughs> oh, well, see, the other says this is an argument of authority. But it's not, it's an argument about the institution. The, in order to produce this very specific science, which is indeed an, an invention in terms of, I mean, a sort of, very, a, 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 it requires lots of modeling, where the data are completely remade retrospectively by the model. Sure. Of course, when you, are, when you have learned your science from uh, geology or so on, you are not supposed to do that. I mean, you are not supposed to remodel all the data from the model. Sure. Yes. So and, and so, uh, uh, the problem is that this science, of climatology, which is an historical science in a way, relies on these techniques. So what do you do in that case? You, 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 and also, I use the word institution in this domain because what is so uh, makes the climatoskeptic furious is that every time you have a data, you have a meeting. So the, 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 the GIEC itself is a very strange thing where scientists vote by country. So again, these people say, this is amazing. I mean, you are voting. Science is not about vote, it's about rationality. No, it's also about vote. <laughs> so there is an invention there, and every science invented its own ways of producing the respect for its institution, physics, physics of course, being a, a, one of them. But now we are stuck because we are, the, the, are, the climatologists are attacked by people who are using all the argument of epistemology. So we can say, yes, it's in balance. Sure. But they say, no, no, you should balance the argument. So whenever there is a climatologist, you have to have your climatoskeptics. That would be balanced. And they say, no, this is not balanced. There is no dispute. And we are, and again, the election of America are going to be partially about this issue, which is absolutely mind-blowing.